if you actually take a look at a map, you can see that our political activities, besides the 13 states where Glass-Steagall has been introduced, our political activities are actually in about 20 other states on various levels. And now we've begun to do something which I think is a lot of fun and imperative, which is to recruit the general population to come with us to actually visit these state houses uh, and meet their local state legislator and put these state legislatures on the spot that they have to take action and they have to take action very, very rapidly. You have a, 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 a certainly a ferment of people who are fed up and when they encounter the ironical, polemical style of the LaRouche pack and they encounter the truth on that basis and the, willing, the willingness to, tell, to, to face reality and to tell the truth, there's a certain relief that comes of this. And it's in that moment of relief that can happen, the self-reflection, for, for these legislators to recognize that this could be the most important thing that they've ever done and that they ever will do as a legislator, is to introduce Glass-Steagall into the, sta the Statehouse, into the Assembly. I think the work we're doing here in the States um, is very critical. I think it's a, um, you know, the obvious first steps to build, uh, to build momentum, to put pressure on Congress is, is from the States. It, it's hard for me to believe that with seven billion people on, on this planet that there's only a, a handful of people that are actually actively working um, in, um, in a effective manner to bring about the changes we need in, a, in order to solve these problems. We've developed a very, um, sort of a very uh, kind of organizing machine that's functioning very well, and I think, um, you know, really when it comes down to it, it is the case. Uh, you know, the the members of Congress, while they are, up, you know, they're, um, you know, they're they're defending the Constitution, they're they're federal representatives. <clears throat> when it comes down to it, they do represent a constituency. So actually, having uh, in addition to our voices as Larouche Pack activists there on the Hill. Um, Telling you know, tell, discussing with them the need for Glass Steagall, you know, in terms of their identity as representing their constituents, it's extremely powerful to have these developments from the state, you know, being able to funnel that in. When the Congress reintroduced Glass Steagall on uh, January third of this year, we knew that we were going to be confronted with a task because when it had been introduced in the last congressional session, it had never been introduced onto the Senate side. So LaRouche Pack had to come up with a strategy of how it was that we were actually going to push Congress forward in a very rapid manner to ensure the introduction of Glass-Steagall, a companion bill to Marcy Kaptur and Walter Jones's bill on the Senate side. So what we decided to do was to take the fight to the state level. And we began to get it introduced. It was very difficult in the beginning to get somebody, some state to step forward. But once the momentum began to build, it then became easier to approach some of the state governments and say to them, look, this is part of a national effort and you have to have a say. And this, that this is imperative. So what we began to do was call through various state legislatures and, uh, I was looking at possibilities based on who in the past had endorsed Glass-Steagall. And in Hawaii, you had uh, Maisie Hirono, who's a congresswoman from Hawaii, who now became a U.S. senator. And I got a response very rapidly, actually, from a member of uh, the state legislature in Hawaii, who's also very concerned with the question of uh, the homelessness in Hawaii and the overall economic collapse. So I began to take a little bit closer look at the question of what was going on in Hawaii economically. And then I began to realize why I was getting such a very dramatic commitment to this question of Glass-Steagall, which is that it's been hit very hard. So in fact, what happened was this particular state legislature took up the question of Glass-Steagall and made sure that he got it introduced uh, 
and it has now passed. It was there was a hearing in front of the Consumer Protection and Commerce Committee, and it passed out of the first committee. And I believe later this week it's going to be heard be in front of the Finance Committee. And if it passes out of the Finance Committee, then it'll actually go for a floor vote. Since January, we've been in the State House in Albany about about five times, I believe. And what we've done is, I mean, we've had meetings probably on the order of 120, 130 meetings that we've had with various offices, many of those re meeting with them repeatedly, seeking out those people who, when you sit them down at the table and you say to them across the table, someone in the New York State uh, legislature has to lead this fight. Uh, for, for that person to see what we're talking about, to get, to get a sense of this. Um, I mean, to set the stage, you have, when we talk to these people, there is, there, is an, there, there is a culture of pragmatism that exists, where we, we had a conversation, a close conversation with, uh, a, with a legislator who told us, well, look, it, what, you're, what you're proposing with Glass-Steagall in terms of shutting down the investment banks' activity as they've been, as they've been active in the past 15 years and so forth, what you're, what you're describing here is actually, it means we're going to have to look at the New York State budget and 20%, he said, he said to me, he quoted that 20% of the New York State budget is <coughs> funded by revenue coming from taxes on investment bank activity. So he said, so what are you going to do about that? What are you going to do about those investments? And we had a moment where <laughs> my... Uh, uh, the organizer I was sitting with, he, uh, he just started laughing because, he, and he has said, investments, you mean theft, right? You mean stealing. You mean outright murder and uh, uh, by, by a pack of swindlers. And the legislator cracked a smile and began to, to laugh at the, own, the, 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 the sheer absurdity. One element of, of this kind of process, which is always critical, is somebody deciding to take individual leadership. And that absolutely was the case um, in Maine with this resolution. Senator John Patrick decided to take up this cause of the re you know, for the reinstatement of Glass-Steagall. And that, is, that, that was a critical part of this process, his decision to take personal leadership. Then we faced you know, the more daunting challenge of organizing the entire Maine Senate and House, um, which is very large. The Senate has 30 members. The, ma the main House of Representatives has 151 members. Um, and I think it's interesting that we ended up, I think, directly speaking with or contacting in some way about a third of, of this body, um, a third of the 151 members of the House. Um, overall, there ended up being between the Senate and the House about 30 co-sponsors. And I think it's very interesting that on the one hand, some of these people were people who um, we were directly contacting and organizing about supporting this resolution, supporting the reinstatement of Glass-Steagall. But in many of the cases, these are people that we didn't speak to directly. So an aspect of this, the process in Maine, which I think is interesting and actually ideal, is when the organizing process um, it sort of takes on a life of its own to a certain extent, where we actually can't account for everybody um, who chose to co-sponsor this bill. And I think that's actually um, an ideal situation. One of the goals also we had going into Minnesota was to get these people talking amongst themselves to each other so that they can uh, so that they can start doing do, so that they can start doing their their job, right? I I, I think. A lot of them really have no, or most of them, most all of them, really have no clear picture of what the real problems we're facing are. And uh, once you, you make it, uh, give them a clear picture of, of what's actually happening and how Glass-Steagall uh, can be used along with the new credit system and a productive economy to, to solve all these uh, issues that they're dealing with, I think it really opens their eyes and... and um, a lot of them are are moving some more than others. Um, the first rep we met to we met with in Minnesota, uh, who who became the the sponsor in the house. Um, 
the, the guys in Minnesota had talked to uh, with a couple of times before, and he had done some homework, and uh, he had some some questions for us. So after we gave him a rundown, uh, uh, clearly explaining Glass Steagall and, and what the problem, um, what what the problem really is uh, with our economy. Um, he shot us these these questions he had on his computer, which were all Wall Street talking points, arguments against Glass Steagall, and uh, so we were able to shoot those all down. And uh, we showed him a, the the clip of Colin Peterson in the Ag Committee um, telling the committee that that if we deregulate this last ten percent of the of the uh, commodities derivatives regulations, that uh, it would come back. To, to haunt us just like the repeal of Glass-Steagall and the 2000 uh, Commodities Modernization Act. And um, after that he picked up the South Dakota resolution, uh, um, called his aide into the office and and uh, told her to have that resolution take taken down to drafting and, and have it drafted up. What we've seen over the past few weeks is a very uh, dramatic and a panicked response from many of the state houses because they saw what occurred in Cyprus. And uh, of course, we approached them again and said, look, we told you that we had to act on Glass-Steagall. You didn't think it was important. And now look what's happening in Cyprus. Uh, so for instance, we were in one of the state houses and um, we were walking into the offices and we said, you know, Cyprus is going to come here. And the woman, before we could even finish the sentence in a state of panic said, I know, they are just going in and stealing people's accounts. Uh, so right away she said, you know, what material do you have? We have to get this done. You know, what more can I do? We've already introduced it and, and so on. And then we went into another office and it turned out the woman actually knew uh, friends in Cyprus. And one of our delegation turned to her and said, well, how are they surviving? And the woman in the office responded by saying, well, they're eating dog food and probably drinking a lot of gin. So now she was half joking, of course, but that's no way to, that's not survival. So this is on people's minds when you walk into the state legislature and they're seeing a very shocking shift between what occurred, what they would thought they were looking at in December and January with the fiscal cliff and the pending sequestration and now they're confronted with a situation where even if they meet their budget requirements, they're basically handing a death notice to their voting public. To, to add one more point on this, look at the, the very uh, well-publicized uh, collapse of community cancer clinics here in New York in particular. I mean, it's happened across the country because of the sequestration cuts that were Obama's cuts but here, uh, you, when we turn on the radio uh, on the last weeks, there's been a, a extensive reports on the fact that there's 5,000 individuals in Long Island alone who have been told over the course of the last weeks of March, you're done. We, we, we cannot provide chemotherapy treatment to you anymore. That's it. You're going to have to find it somewhere else. And which they don't have any hopes of doing because of what Obamacare has done to the hospitals. And this is, uh, this is openly known. This is well understood. Uh, people running up in the streets yesterday in the middle of midtown Manhattan on the basis of what's happening to the health care system. It's, so I would just say that it's, it's the fact that this is so completely out in the open. It's this sort of turning point where it's, uh, it's not, it's not, it cannot be hit at all in the slightest that has given, uh, that has transformed the potential of our fight in the State House. And most importantly, we really are dealing with a dire economic situation. If we don't get Glass-Steagall implemented immediately, and I mean in the near future, you are going to see mass death across the nation. The budget cuts that are coming down from, from Washington and what the states have had to pass in terms of uh, uh, legislation is going to devastate the general population. And many of these legislators know it. In Florida, in North Carolina, and I'm sure there are other states, they have now reduced unemployment insurance massively. 
It normally used to be 25 weeks. It's now down to 12 weeks. That's three months. And you're dealing with a situation where we already know you have long-term widespread unemployment. You combine that with the budget cuts that are now coming down from President Obama on the, the CPI uh, and Social Security, the cuts on cancer treatment. You're looking at a situation where these state elected officials recognize that they are faced with a situation where their voting public, the general population, will die because of these policies. And when we come to them with the, with, with the voting public and say, look, this is unacceptable, they're beginning to hear us. For example, some, uh, somebody who I was in discussion with uh, before this resolution actually um, came into fruition was a person, leading member of the main building trades, who is very, um, very vocally supportive of Glass-Steagall. I mean, Maine is not a state where there are, uh, you know, great um, financial institutions. So I would say in terms of the, you know, the support you were getting from this overall, it's not from people who are, um, you know, there's some anomalous cases. It, it wasn't from people who are, um, have a lot of knowledge of, of banking per se, but people who, you know, whose jobs and whose livelihood is tied to the physical economy, and they really saw this as the first step to getting that kind of a program moving. Pretty much everybody we talked to, I would show this chart that Maria Cantwell had on her floor speech that is a graphic representation of the, um, of the physical assets versus derivatives assets in, in our economy. And uh, so we discussed that the, the, the thin little yellow line at the bottom of the graph uh, compared to the mountain of, uh, of derivatives on top of it, how that, that, that thin line is what keeps us alive. It's our productive economy. It's, uh, you know, farming, manufacturing industry, uh, Main Street, it's the real physical assets and that and that once that mountain of derivatives is removed that there's really not much left of an economy that, that we have to work with. So so then we stress that uh, um, that would then have to be, uh, the gap would have to be filled with um, with new credit from Congress through a Hamiltonian credit system uh, specifically designed to develop um, projects like NAWAPA uh, that would build our, rebuild our industry, manufacturing, and science-driven development programs uh, that would uh, provide jobs, provide people with, a, um, with work that is meaningful, that has uh, that you know the work that they would do then would contribute to the the future of 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 our society that would uh, sustain our civilization into the future. For instance, in Maryland, uh, what happened at the beginning of this legislative session in December January was it was announced that one of the largest steel uh, producers in the United States, 50 years ago it produced the, the largest amount of steel, uh, Bethlehem Steel, Sparrows Point, uh, was shut down and actually auctioned off. And this is part of the reason why a portion of Baltimore has been renamed a death zone, because the economy has completely disintegrated. And what you see is a situation where there is no real economic productivity and the gambling casinos and the lotteries that they keep pushing have not produced the kind of jobs, obviously, that are necessary. So when we went in to the State House of Maryland and met with many of these state legislators, we presented them with our three-point program and said, yes, first we're going to do Glass-Steagall. That is imperative because we have to actually stop the hemorrhaging and the financial meltdown. Next, we're going to implement a national bank, and then here's our national global perspective, NAWAPA, and so on. And that they began to get. And then the discussions would grow in terms of the real potential. They were still pessimistic, but I think they very much appreciated the fact that we actually have a national perspective, a, a real solution, a pathway out of this very, very dark tunnel 
uh, where they see no light or no evidence of any light at the end of the tunnel. Glass-Steagall needs to be reinstated. It's, it's a, the issue is an issue of function. It's not an issue of size. It's an issue of, of uh, reasserting what the priority is in terms of the U.S. economy, that the priority is not financial speculation, that Glass-Steagall, as we've discussed, is the first step to catalyzing a physical economic recovery and stating that the priority is a functioning commercial banking system so that we can begin to get an actual economic recovery. And, and the priority is not financial speculation and, and bailing that out. You know, this is also um, consistent with, for example, people saying, well, we should see if, uh, if Dodd-Frank <coughs> is possibly, you know, we, we should give Dodd-Frank some more time to work. And, um, you know, there's actually been very devastating revelations re with respect to this in recent, uh, in recent days, in recent weeks, indications that potentially the kind of, uh, you know, what you saw occur in Cyprus, um, the direct seizure of, of money of depositors as in terms of, uh, you know, a bail-in mechanism, that this is potentially implied in Title II of Dodd-Frank. I mean, one way to look at it is with the Wall Street deployments. Uh, I mean, we, you know, of course, we've been doing Wall Street for decades and decades. And in the recent period, as I said, we, we totally increased what we've been doing there. <clears throat> the response is different. It was much more heightened. You had people uh, running up to the table. What is a Hamiltonian credit system? I need to know. That was the first thing someone said to me, asking, <clears throat> what, is, what is LaRouche's take on this? What's going to happen next? What should I know? Uh, we had a guy from... <clears throat> Deutsche Bank, uh, who came up and he, uh, <laughs> he was speaking to one of our organizers and he said, well, what are you doing? And, and we said, well, we're, we're going to pass Glass-Steagall and shut down these criminal investment banks. We're going to shut down these gangsters. And he said, well, I work for them, you know. And we said, well, don't you have any other skills? <laughs> and he said, well, I was trained as an engineer. And we said, well, then don't worry. <laughs> We've got you covered. You're, uh, <laughs> you're going to be brought into the process. You'll have a job. Don't worry. And he signed up. I mean, we ran into other people on Wall Street who said, well, I'm for genocide. Very explicitly said, I, I think we should have massive austerity. I think we should, we should cut the living standard drastically. Um, because they, it's gotten to a point where they have to, they have to rule. Am I, <clears throat> am I for human, humanity or am I for uh, you know, the British Empire? I think one of the things that we probably will need to work on here shortly is is educating these community bankers because they have no idea what the american system of economics is either so and since here in minnesota we have all these senators asking for for bankers you know to come testify one of the uh one of the issues we had in south dakota uh, getting bankers to endorse it was they were afraid they were going to get uh pulled into some congressional hearing where they'd have to testify about how to how to restructure the financial system after the implementation of Glass-Steagall and they just don't know because they don't know what the American system is so uh, the uh, draft legislation that that Michael wrote included in the, in the Hamiltonian banking system is I think going to be crucial uh, in that matter uh, educating these these bankers on what the American system is because they don't they don't know what it is they you know we've been We've been trained for the last 50 years that um, that our economy is money in markets. Imagine what we can accomplish. Just, I mean, my God, if we get when we when we get breakthroughs on this, if when we have a a a the passage of Glass Steagall in the United States uh, completely changes the culture completely. Uh, the biggest shift in power in centuries, if not millennia. I heard of a letter that, that uh, one of our West Coast activists had received from a young activist in Cyprus, where she said something similar to what this young man had told me. She said, I, um, she said, actually, I, I, I am so, we are, 
keep doing what you're doing. She said, keep fighting what you're fighting because we depend so much on what you do. Here in Cyprus, it can feel as though there's nothing that can be done against the giants, as though we're fighting the giants and there's no chance for survival. And it, what we, our hope it, it d depends on, on your continuance of, of the fight that, that, that Linda LaRouche has, uh, has developed. I actually have a, a family friend who I am uh, in touch with in Belgium, which is sort of the, the center of the European um, oligarchy. And just to relay this anecdote, when I told him about the work that I was involved in here to pass Glass-Steagall in the United States, he literally said, what a beautiful ambition. If you were to do this, the entire world would applaud. You know, it's interesting that you actually have several, um, you've had voices of support for Glass-Steagall from European governments, from various parliaments. Um, but in terms of taking action on this that is actually going to move the world, I think people really are looking, uh, even those European countries and, and supporters of Glass-Steagall in Europe are really looking to the United States um, to be, you know, to be the ones that really take the first step. Therefore, I think the work that we're doing is is critical, not only to the United States, but as as Linda stressed, uh, um, Europe is is being crushed, and since they don't have the constitutional system uh, to work with that we do here in America, I think that the work we're doing in America uh, is critical to to reestablishing a a global Glass-Steagall standard, a uh, new Bretton Woods system, and, uh, and all of these different projects that will give us the opportunity to cooperate with other nation states uh, to promote peace through development. My message very straightforward would be that there is a solution. I would also say that we are running out of time and that the time has come for people to step forward and not hesitate, not give their fears, uh, give in to any of their fears, but to actually step forward onto the world stage and recognize that because there is a solution, there is a pathway out of this hell. Yes, we are on the brink of hell. You could argue in some areas of the world, we are in hell. However, if individuals don't take personal moral responsibility, to step forward and say to themselves, I will take personal responsibility to ensure that this happens, then we will lose a profound and great moment in history. You don't want to have the kind of regret where in the future you look back at chaos and hell and death of billions of people because we failed to do this and regret that you didn't do more when you could have. And therefore, I say to all of these legislators, I say to all of our American elected officials that have within their power to take this action and to take it immediately, there is no reason to further hesitate on this moment. And to the, our international audience, I would say that we here in the United States are determined to bring back the great and profound tradition of what America represents and to ensure that not only the United States reverses its own economic crisis, but to actually be a guiding light for the future for the planet.